welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you that are joining us from uh, uh, the outside, uh, I am Felipe Correa. I'm the chair of the Department of Architecture here at the University of Virginia uh, School of Architecture. Uh, it is really an absolute pleasure to introduce tonight architect and writer Jesus Basayo. Basayo has developed a prolific body of work advancing architectural ideas through a wide ranging and multifaceted approach. A practicing architect, a writer, and an educator, Basajo's work revisit the, revisits the role of realism in architecture as, an, as a thread that weaves through his scholarly and professional work. Trained at ETSAM and at Harvard GSD, Basajo is currently an associate professor of architecture at Rice University, where he has taught for the last seven years. Prior to joining Rice, he was a project architect for the Spanish award-winning firm of Mancilla and Tuñón Arquitectos, where he led many of their most high-profile projects before establishing his own design practice in Houston. In addition to his design practice, Vasallo is the author of two recent books, Seamless, Digital Collage and Dirty Realism in Contemporary Architecture, published in 2016, and Epics in the Everyday, Architecture, Photography, and the Problem of Realism, published in 2019 uh, and the main dish, of course, of tonight's talk. Both books, Seamless and Epics in the Everyday, share a common theme. They explore notions of the real in architecture and architectural photography. More specifically, Epics in the Everyday traces the time-honored relationship between architecture and documentary photography and the affinities and differences that emerge between architect and photographer, opening dialogue, a dialogue about notions of realism in each discipline and how these have evolved over the past half century. Vasallo's current examination of the real in architecture through both, uh, through both books is not only rigorous, but also timely. As digital technologies have drastically transformed our notions of realism and architectural representation, both in the academy and in practice, Vasallo's deeper historical arc helps us place current representational practices in a broader professional and disciplinary context. Please join me in welcoming Jesus to UVA tonight. Jesus, welcome. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you so much for the invitation, but also such a generous uh, introduction. I'm really happy to be back in uh, UV UVA. At, uh, I have to say I'd much rather visit in person your beautiful campus and wonderful people at the school, but uh, this will suffice uh, for today, and I look forward to, to being back in person soon. So um, I'm gonna share my screen. So like Felipe said, today's main dish is this book that sort of was published uh, six, seven, seven months ago at the end of 2019, Epics in the Everyday Photography, Architecture and the Problem of Realism. And one, one way that, uh, that this book is received is as being about uh, photography, architecture and, and photography. And so I sometimes, and actually yesterday I was in a similar event and I was introduced as someone who is an expert in, in image making. So this is, this is true in the sense that um, these two books that Felipe mentioned are, came out of my doctoral research, which was very heavy on an exploration of photography and the, the, the larger sort of arc of, of relationship between photography and architecture. So this was a, like all PhD students I made, or not all of them, but like some PhD students, I made the mistake of choosing sort of too, too wide a topic and too wide a uh, time period. So between mid uh, 19th century all the way to today, it was a flurry of case studies and sort of observations about moments when architecture and photography had come in contact with a lot of intensity. And then out of that research came two books where these this sort of topics and events were clarified a little bit more. So in seamless uh, digital collage and dirty realism in contemporary architecture, I focused more uh, as, as the subtitle indicates in a contemporary condition. And I focused basically on a series of what I called cro crossover practices. So 
very intense collaborations between architects and artists that were practicing uh, uh, together and were actually the the boundaries between uh, between art and architecture and image and and, and building became uh, blurred so there were three case studies in this book i, I wrote about the collaboration between artist Bas Prinsen and uh, the architecture office of Kirsten Gers and David Van Severen. The second case study was on the work of Philip Shatter, a visual artist, and uh, the office of uh, Roger Bolshauser in Zurich. And, and then finally on uh, the architect Jan de Velder and the photographer and artist uh, Philippe de Jardin, who are Flemish, Flemish based. And um, this was really like a really thin slice, but a very deep uh, look into basically a group of people that I, that I know more or less personally who are roughly my age or a little bit older, but roughly, I mean, they are all our contemporaries and these are uh, uh, collaborations that are ongoing and, and where they would not be possible without uh, basically the digital post-production uh, technology, which somehow puts the artist and the architect in an equal playing field or sort of allows this blurring uh, that is very specific to a moment in time. Then on the, uh, even though I made some uh, sort of larger references to the arc of the history of photography and, and the relationship between photography and architecture, uh, that's really what I, what I developed in the second book, which came out more recently, Ethics in the Everyday, where I really tried to both provide um, Perhaps clarify what is the, the what are the theoretical implications of the of the of the research and the episodes that I'm compiling, and also maybe set up like a more robust uh, historic uh, um, context, basically for for the argument that I'm making. And uh, and then basically in this case the the time frame is very heavy on the second half of the 20th century, even though it sort of does get close to to uh, to our time as well. So again, photography and architecture seem to be, it's like a way to describe it that is very uh, somehow methodological, right? It has to do with the formats and the disciplines, et cetera. But there is another layer to the content that is this idea of, uh, of realism, basically. So, uh, and, and that has both ethical and aesthetic, uh, and aesthetic uh, components to it, and which could be detachable from the art history argument that I'm making about the discipline of architecture and the discipline of, of photography coming together and, and coming apart in different moments. So perhaps today I'd like to emphasize this idea, more abstract idea of, of realism and try to explain how it sort of uh, uh, intersects with, with uh, the different topics. So these are just some more images of the books to entice you to buy them. They're really, really nice, very well designed. My brother Luis Osalo is a really amazing graphic designer. We always work together, so we take pride in these uh, books being really nice objects. Okay, now done with the self-promotion. Um, what do I mean by realism? So this is an image that I really like and that I really like to show. I think it's very useful. It's one of the images that Eric Mendelssohn took for his book, uh, America, which uh, basically traveled through North America for the first time with a camera and compiled the photographs that he took of the skyscrapers, silos, factories, etc., into, into a magnificent uh, uh, volume of photography. Eric Mendelssohn was, was an architect, but he was very adept at, at photography. And I mean, I could have used an image, uh, one of the images that Le Corbusier uh, used as, as well, where he would borrow stock images of silos for his publications, right? But I like, somehow I like this one uh, better. To, for the point that I that I'm going to make, which is that in the first uh, for the first generation of uh, modern architects, when they were looking at uh, at these green silos, they were of course fascinated by the simplicity of their shapes and forms. Like Le Corbusier talked about the sort of interplay of uh, volumes under light, etc. But there was another layer to to their fascination with these objects, which was the fact that this was the like an almost unexplained uh, urban phenomenon or physical phenomenon happening in the world. These were large constructions that were somehow had been generated uh, outside of the discipline of architecture and outside of academia. So especially for European avant-garde architects, when they were looking 
at, uh, at uh, the sort of North American industry. For them, this was a vernacular. They, they didn't know, I mean, these were designed by engineers and built by construction uh, firms. All of the people who did these things had college degrees, but from Europe, this was a sort of uh, vernacular. And they were not only, they were not only looking at these things as abstract uh, shapes that sort of resonated with uh, their love of, uh, of avant-garde painting and avant-garde sculpture, they were looking at them also in the sense that it was very rough uh, sort of uh, and, and really sort of not considered parts of the written world. And the reason why I would like to foreground this is because I, in, in my assessment, one of the bigger problems that we have in, in architecture today is that somehow we have come to understand architecture with a capital A and uh, the built environment as not only different categories, but almost uh, mutually exclusive categories. While on the other hand, I think this is a good example of uh, how uh, in the sort of, uh, in this uh, interwar period or avant-garde period of early 20th century, for the first generation of modernists at least, there was a balance between uh, sort of uh, formal or abstracting principles or pulsions and uh, materialist, uh, uh, materialist uh, sort of pulsions. So on the other hand, we skip forward to, to our day, and this is the opposite in my mind. This is not an image that I like, this is an image that I despise. This is something that got built as I was sort of uh, an architecture student in Spain. So in the foreground, we can see uh, Santiago Calatrava's uh, City of the Arts and Sciences in Valencia which is a building that is completely uh, a foreground, a building that is sort of, which doesn't really have a function other than becoming a, a, a monument for the sort of politicians that, that uh, paid for it with uh, taxpayer money. And that's archi architecture with a capital A, at least at the apex of the star architect moment, right? And then on the right of the image, we get a glimpse of the built environment, right? Which is the opposite. It's architecture is foreground, the built environment is background, architecture is expensive, the built environment is cheap, meaning that it's sort of uh, the more resources should go into, into its construction, uh, more consideration should be uh, given to it. But also, on the other hand, it's, it's actually fulfilling a necessary function to, to make cities to make cities work. So, um, in a way, the and th this is sort of was my thought process when I was starting to do this research about realism. And, what I tried to do, the first thing that I tried to do as a PhD student is to make a list of uh, architects that I thought somehow had tried to retain or to maintain alive this sort of realist drive throughout, uh, throughout the 20th century with somehow the intuition that perhaps there was like a secondary line or an alternative uh, line within, within modernism that could be characterized with this idea of an ethos and an aesthetic of realism. Uh, so here you can see the famous uh, images that uh, Addison and Peter Smithson used to, to somehow present themselves as an alternative to, uh, to the orthodoxy of, of modernist planning that were taken by, uh, by Nigel Henderson. And that was perhaps the, as I made this list, uh, one thing that I realized is that almost in every generation I could identify a few architects that had this sort of rebel attitude of, of uh, realism and this sort of approach to the uh, anonymous fabric of the city as something that was important for their work. And almost uh, in all cases, there was this secondary thing, which is that these architects have been really obsessed with uh, photography as a way precisely to get closer to what they understood to be the, the sort of authentic uh, uh, sub subject matter of, of the built environment or of the city around them. And um, sometimes this obsession with photography came by way of themselves becoming photographers like Eric Mendelssohn, but other times it was through intense association with established photographers, right? And, and then the third realization, as I was making this list, trying to, to corral the sort of the scope of my, of my thesis, was that these photographers themselves that tended to associate with architects, they were, in and of themselves, they, were, they formed another lineage in the sense that they were identifiable as being part of the tradition of documentary photography, but they were also a very particular subset of documentary photographers. That they were sort of not the reportage type or were somehow in a line that had like a stronger formal leaning and sort of were a little bit more detached from the influence of the social sciences in documentary photography. So it was almost as if you had this 
against secondary strains of architects within the evolution of modernity trying to remain realist and then documentary photographers within the evolution of documentary photography time trying to retain a certain autonomy of photography as a practice and trying to resist the overwhelming uh, sort of push of, uh, of the social uh, sciences, which is, as you know, like sort of one, one, one big trend throughout the development of uh, content, modern and contemporary work. So in the end, in the book, I, I basically made a strategic selection of only four case studies that I looked into with more, much more depth. So the first one is uh, uh, the Smithsons and uh, Nigel Henderson in London. The second is uh, Ed Rouché and uh, Venturi and Scott Brown, basically on how the uh, Ed Rouché's efforts to, to with his publications on on the city and buildings became a very big influence on Venturi and Scott Brown as they were setting themselves to, for instance, study Las Vegas, but also to study Sproul and to, to, to study the sort of urbanism of, of the car and, uh, and the West Coast, etc. To a point where they basically just adopted his photographic techniques for their own publications. Right? And this in turn had an influence in their work. So these are two, the first two case studies are what would you could describe as pre, as uh, sort of post-war, uh, canonical post-war examples. The, the second or second set of two basically, so case studies three and four are on the other hand much closer to our time. So I wrote the chapter on uh, the collaboration between Thomas Roof and uh, Herzog and Demeron. This is an image taken by Roof of a building that they designed together, that they uh, devised together, which is the uh, library at the Technical University in Everswalde in, uh, in Eastern Germany. And, uh, and then the last case study, even closer to our time, is the ongoing relationship between the office of Alan Caruso and Peter St. John in London, in the German uh, photographer and artist uh, Thomas de Mike. That was developed through a series of uh, exhibitions that they designed together, but then actually sort of at one point evolved into actual proposals where this is an image from a competition that they won and they were very close to, very close to actually building in Zurich. And, and basically, as, as I was working on this material, I realized that something happened in between these two sets of case study where if we think of the type of relationships between photographers and architects in the post-war period, and as I was trying to describe with Rouché, the relationship was one based on cultural consumption, basically. So the architects identified the vision of the photographer as more advanced, basically, and sort of sharper, and therefore able to deliver to them in a more raw state this sort of reality of the city for them to use in their work. It was architects, for the most part, consuming and appropriating the work of photography versus uh, skip forward to the uh, closer to the end of the 20th century. And what you have again is a much more imbricated relationship of collaborations where uh, something has happened and the role of the architect and the artist uh, have become somehow much more equivalent. And, and there is a give and take uh, where sometimes it's even hard to tell like who's doing what. And, uh, uh, and really there has been a transformation not only in the sort of one-to-one -one relationship between these people, but a larger transformation of the relative position of architecture and photography among themselves and within the, the sort of ecosystem of, of the arts, basically. So the question for me became like, what happens uh, in the middle, right? What happens between, say, 1965, 1975, 1960, 1970, where there is this very radical change, not only in the relationship between the arts, but also in the way that artists and architects approach uh, the, the, real, the reality of the built environment. And basically that's the core of what I wanna talk about today uh, for the next, uh, the next few minutes. And then hopefully at the end, I can get back to um, a little bit of a consideration of how that bears uh, on architecture, how that continues to bear on architecture and then open it up for a larger discussion. I mean, in a way, this is a very long book that encompasses many, many years of study. So I have just to admit uh, uh, that it is not really possible for me to just summarize and give it to you in some you know, in a neat summary. So I'd rather just pick one chunk, which I think is most relevant perhaps, and then hopefully have a discussion about it. So this is an image uh, where I'm basically comparing two images from the early uh, early 60s. I'm sure you know 
at least one of them on the left is one of the famous photographs of Robert Venturi's uh, mother's house. So designed in the very early 60s and then sort of finished uh, in 66. And then on the right, uh, an image of one of the first works by Dan Flavin, one of his icon, of the icon series of sculptures, where you can see this very similar foregrounding of, uh, of the generic sort of light, light fixture as a very, very some, somehow sur surprisingly, uh, uh, surprising foregrounding of uh, an arbitrary banal element. Right? And I think it is fair to say that in the, in the early to mid 60s, this is something that was happening across the board in the arts and in architecture that you have very different uh, people that eventually became either pop artists or conceptual artists or postmoderns, etc. So eventually their careers took them in very different directions. But in the early to mid 60s, there was just this emphasis on the artifacts of the built environment that everyone was fascinated with. So, and that that is something that I, that I think is uh, that I, that I think is maybe never sort of uh, never acknowledged enough. Then, within this variety of people looking at the built environment, I would say there is an interesting subset uh, of the group that became eventually known as a sort of a, um, conceptual and sort of minimal art uh, group that had a more specific focus. So perhaps they were not so interested in the objects of consumption, such as the pop artists were. They were more interested in the actual, like almost fragments of buildings, right? And sort of uh, the building stuff. So uh, this is the, one of the very first sculptures that uh, Donald Judd produced. I think this is 1962. And basically Donald Judd, many of you may know this, but he was actually a painter until this point in his career. And his first sculptures were made of fragments of the building that he was occupying, a sort of loft, uh, light, abandoned light industrial building in Manhattan. Basically where he would just gather sort of fragments of palette and pipe and mesh. And that's how he concocted his first uh, set of uh, uh, sculptures. There's an art historian that I, I really like and has been very influential for me, Joshua Shannon, uh, who teaches at Yale who has written extensively about this moment. And he says, basically explains how for the, generally for North American art, art, artists, but specifically for the ones in New York, the, the place where they lived was a very important influence because at the time, uh, at this time of the early sixties, the city was transforming at, at a really breakneck speed. So it's actually, I think, hard for us looking at New York today to understand how fast it was changing at that point with the industry leaving the city or, or at least going to the outskirts of the city and, uh, and the new service economy or rather new financial economy uh, moving in. So it was like a transition of power between industry and the uh, financial and real estate uh, industries as being the core of the city that brought with it that radical change of the built environment. Industry was leaving these buildings in Manhattan and the artists were flooding in and so it, Initially, they were almost like grasping or what Joshua Shannon argues, and I agree, is that they were grasping at the sort of fragments of this former uh, order of things, basically, to, to produce their work. So there's almost like a nostalgia in the way that they're looking at uh, a built environment that is changing very aggressively. Uh, another artist of that group that I think sheds a really uh, interesting light on this fascination with, with the built environment is uh, Sol Luit. So he wrote a text that is not very uh, well known in um, uh, 1966 called Cigarettes, which was uh, published in, in Art Forum. It's a short piece where he talks about these buildings that had been uh, uh, shaped uh, basically by the, the building code enacted in 1916. That had, it was a sort of piece of formal planning, very, very famous and short. I'm sure you know about it. Basically, these setback forms were are given of, of, of the way that uh, the code was written. And he talks about, he was really fascinated by the fact that somehow uh, the forms of these buildings were predetermined and that that was a really great thing for the architect to basically not have to decide the, the forms themselves. And if you don't mind, I'd like to read the paragraph or a small excerpt because I think it's really illuminating how he talks about it. So uh, when he writes about how these shapes are inevitable, and how this is a positive thing, he writes, uh, quote unquote, 
The zoning code preconceived the design of the ciudades, just as an idea might give any work of art its outer boundaries and remove arbitrary and capricious decisions. So for those of you who are familiar with, uh, 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 with Lewitt and his, and his sort of writing and thinking, you may realize that this is actually very similar to, to the language that he uses a few months later in his Manifesto for Conceptual Art, uh, a famous piece also published in Art Forum, Paragraphs on Conceptual Art, where he sort of basically gives this, uh, this sort of a blueprint for a whole generation of artists, and where he writes, in conceptual art, the idea or concept is the most important aspect of the work. When an artist uses a conceptual form of art, it means that all of the planning and decisions are made beforehand, and the execution is a perfunctory affair. The idea becomes a machine that makes the art. To work with a plan that is preset is one way of avoiding subjectivity. After that, the fewer decisions made in the course of completing the work, the better. This eliminates the arbitrary, the capricious, and the subjective as much as possible. So what I think is happening here, and I'm not the only one who has written uh, about it, actually Julian Rose has a sort of really, really great passage about it, is a, an artist that is basically, feels absolutely fascinated by the way that anonymous construction is uh, somehow prescribed by a series of arbitrary and positivistic factors such as building codes, uh, construction technology, uh, sort of spreadsheets, etc. Right, and feels like this is a truly liberating thing, uh, to the point that feels compelled to actually adopt or sort of model an, an art practice on this idea of uh, of a series of, of protocols that liberates the artist from from choice and from having to be special somehow, or having to having to work through uh, their subjectivity. But they, it's not just uh, uh, Sol Lewitt or, or Donald Judd. This is something, a topic that is prevalent across the generations. Another seminal uh, work of art, by, in this case by Dan Graham, uh, called Homes for America, and also sort of in a publication piece where he would basically photograph these tract housing developments that he saw in the train uh, going to New Jersey. And he, and he wrote this piece where he talks about the systematicity of how they're put together in a way that is slightly ironic. So he talks about the, how, how these are almost automatically produced. And, and, and similarly to, to Sol Lewitt, in, in, in the end what comes through is a sort of a, almost admiration for the, uh, for the, and you can see here these permutations of different patterns, basically how he's almost reverse engineering from this anonymous approach to the construction of the built environment, an approach to, to an art practice. And if you, uh, allow me, I can read another short uh, fragment by Dan Graham uh, belonging to this piece where he says, both architecture and craftsmanship as values are subverted by the dependence on simplified and easily duplicated techniques of fabrication and standardized mod modular plans. Contingencies such as mass production technology and land use economics make the final decisions, denying the architect its former unique role. And he puts unique uh, under, under sort of uh, between quotation marks. So again, very, very similar uh, a case where he is identifying the sort of relentless uh, logic of uh, anonymous construction as, 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 a, as a basically a model or a template for, for uh, producing his own work. And then, I mean, we could add more. I would just sort of bring here Robert Smithson's uh, Monuments of Passaic, which in his case, he doesn't so much focus on the, the developments, but more in the sort of loose spaces that happen in between, like how this new urbanization of the periphery brings about these sort of uh, territories that are nobodies, and where he does very directly identifies uh, these existing buildings and proposes them as a sculpture or as monuments, right? So, uh, and this, I think it's useful to, re to remember this because from our standpoint today, when we think of uh, uh, conceptual and, and uh, minimal art, we think of it as being non-representational, right? In, in, in its very origin, I think it's very important to, to understand that it was, if not directly representational, at least very directly elusive of and inspired uh, sort of by uh, the, the sort of the built environment. And again, the abstract quality, similar to Mendelssohn's silos, the abstract quality of the work comes not just from a, a idealized uh, approach to geometry, but from the actual schematic geometry and quality of the uh, of the 
world that is not designed or not designed by architects. And we've already talked about Ed Rocher and his sort of a, a very similar approach to, in this case, the, the documentation of the commercial vernacular of LA. And eventually, these art, artists go different ways. So, for instance, uh, Donald Jett, who, who basically started his career salvaging the, the remains of an industrial city, ends up perhaps giving, giving, giving in to the allure of these new sort of glass uh, abstract buildings of the, of the new finance economy and somehow uh, he, he just feels fascinated by the materials of corporate architecture and, and, and corporate capitalism similar to to interestingly enough uh, Dan Graham at least in his pavilions where he's very directly working with the actual materials of, of uh, modern uh, skyscrapers right not, 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 not really with the old cigarette the materiality of the old cigarettes but with the new glass boxes of the Sort of banks and their and the insurance companies. In the case of Robert Spinson, it's it's different. I mean, he he does uh, sort of present a very clear position of resistance and criticism. Uh, that, that is, even though his work is very hermetic, but he's sort of clearly positioned himself uh, that way. So, regardless of of the different sort of aesthetic approaches or, or the different ways that they develop their their careers. It's again important to realize that at the start of their careers, what they are responding is against this sort of myth of subjectivity and uniqueness that came from the apex of uh, American modern uh, modernism and American modern art, basically with abstract expressionism. So they were basically against the tortured self and subjectivity of the master painting, transferring the depth, the deep scars, and the deep experience of his life into the canvas through the authentic motion of, of his body, they were proposing the inauthentic, banal, and impersonal uh, sort of uh, cheap architecture of the gas station. So this is not coincidental. This is really at, at the core of what this generation is doing. And so at its time, uh, in, within art circles, many times this was uh, received as a sort of internal move. Basically, a generation of uh, artists uh, trying to displace a former generation by, by sort of, uh, uh, and, and, and they were also in doing that um, sometimes sort of identified as, as sort of, some of these things were identified as careerism, so to speak. But I think there's a very different way to look at this, which is that they were genuinely fascinated and preoccupied with the fact that the built environment around them was changing at an increase, increasing speed to the extent that they really felt the need to make sense of it. So this is an image that has been used many times to illustrate uh, Tony, Tony Smith's uh, famous passage on the New Jersey uh, Turnpike, which is something that he would bring up uh, recursively in interviews and in his writing, where he basically took a, a drive uh, through the New Jersey Turnpike before it was finished at night. And, and he described it as being in a different planet, basically, as like an experience that he was not prepared for. And he, he basically described this whole sort of new uh, uh, reality of the periphery of the city as an artificial uh, landscape without cultural presence. That's the sort of very, I think, really smart phrase that he used to, to describe it. So what I posit is that when this generation of conceptual and, and, and minimal artists and using photography were looking at these new unexplained urban phenomena and developments, they were not so much, I mean, they were on the one hand saying previous art forms are no longer valid, but in my mind, more importantly, they were saying there's a new built reality that has not been accounted for, and we need to make sense of it even if, uh, if at least uh, aesthetically. This, I'm sure, sort of resonates with, with the approach of contemporary architects or when, when uh, when Turian Scott Brown look at Las Vegas, they do it explicitly because they know it's going to be offensive to their colleagues at academia who will not uh, lower themselves to look at this sort of commercial sprawl and, and this type of urban phenomena that have, uh, uh, that have happened or have uh, emerged outside of their influence and outside of their cultural milieu. So I think this acceptance and, and earnest curiosity about the uh, anonymous built environment becomes even more clear in the next generation. So uh, up to now, we were going between 1961 and 1970. 
this is 1975, which is the year of the uh, uh, New Topographics uh, exhibition, which was a group show of, uh, uh, of photography where we find the next generation of what we could call post-conceptual artists embracing the full powers of uh, fine art photography in order to look at this, uh, at this reality of the built environment. So uh, this is Robert Adams looking at the periphery of Denver. This is Joe Deal looking at the outskirts of uh, Albuquerque in New Mexico. And where there is different degrees. This was a big show with, I think, 12 uh, photographers. And there was a big influence of uh, minimal and conceptual work on, on these photographers to different degrees. Here, for instance, there was a very clear protocol where Joe Deal would only take photographs from the top of a hill looking down in a way that it would allow him to avoid the horizon line and just fill the frame of the camera with, uh, with whatever was there, basically. So he, he designed the protocol to reduce choice, basically to reduce subjectivity in very much in line with, uh, uh, with what I, I was describing before in the writings of Sol Lewitt and Graham, etc. And then, uh, of course, the work of Louis Valls also in that exhibition, which is in my, in my mind the most explicit, basically, in that it's somehow as if he uh, carries with this obsession of the conceptual artist with the anonymous built environment, with the sort of actual reality of cities and landscapes around, around them, but he feels like he can almost find, uh, uh, instead of using that as inspiration for a sculptural work, that with his camera, he can find these works as ready-made in the landscape, basically. So, and somehow skip the production of three-dimensional work altogether. And I think this is an interesting, interesting point where perhaps I find a lot of parallels in the work uh, of Louis Valls with what I was trying to describe before uh, in the first photograph by Eric Mendelssohn of the, of the North American silos. Right? So Eric Mendelssohn was fascinated by these silos that had came from out of nowhere, right? this sort of physical residue of industrial capitalism. And then by the time we get to 1975, we find people like Louis Valls fascinated with the material residue that has been brought about by late capitalism, basically, right, service capitalism. But in a very similar way where this is valued, or I think the way that uh, Louis Baltz looks at this is not only because of the, the raw materiality uh, representing something, uh, something authentic that needs to be accounted for, even in, in, in its inauthenticity, but also because uh, of, of somehow trying to digest how uh, these things that are not designed can actually uh, represent a certain aesthetic or a certain formal order. So I think I see a similar balance between formal considerations and a sort of more materialist approach. And then the last uh, uh, sort of uh, artist that I'd like to talk about, which was included in the, in the New Topographics exhibition, are uh, Bernd and Hila Becher, who were the only non-American photographers. And it's actually very interesting and clarifying to look at, at, at Bernard Hila Becher's uh, photography of um, industrial structures because somehow they reproduce this whole arch uh, between the, the 50s and the, and the 70s that I was trying to describe in America. But for them, it happens in isolation in Central Europe, right? So they start their career in 1958, become famous in 1972, at which point they're immediately connected with this group of uh, 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 conceptual and, and minimal artists. But when they start, actually, uh, they start to document these uh, industrial structures similarly to what I was describing uh, with Donald Jett as almost like a nostalgic effort to preserve something that was disappearing. So in the late 50s, uh, with, the, uh, with the European Union coming together, there is uh, a big chunk of uh, German industry that had to do with the production of iron and coal that becomes uh, no longer sure, viable. So a lot of these structures began to disappear and, and Bernd Becher was a native of the Seeger region and he, his family uh, going back generations had always been somehow related to, to the industrial world. So they, they, it's actually someone who's feeling that, he's, uh, that the built environment uh, that he has experienced in his life is disappearing who's feeling the drive to go uh, and sort of use photography in a way to freeze it in time. And actually something that not many people know is that the first uh, photographic expedition that the Beckers take is to document these uh, 18th century workers' houses in the Seagate region. So these were the, uh, 
the houses where miners and other sort of industry workers live at the very beginning of the industrialization process in, in, in middle Germany. And again, I think it's really hard looking at these images not to see a, a project that is very somehow backward looking and very nostalgic. And then, however, as the work uh, progresses and they start to document more and more types of industrial structures, and as they develop a very sharp and sort of regimented language, photographic language for the depiction, and they start to refine this idea of a, um, objective photographic language, the work starts, starts to take on a different, uh, a different light, basically. So, uh, and I think this is a good example where we can see how between the late 50s and the, and the mid 60s, the work has oscillated between something that is uh, arch archaeological uh, documentation to something that has much more of a formal interest or a morphological interest. So they started arranging uh, images in these grids that they called typologies in a not, not completely correct use of uh, ar uh, architectural terminology. But basically where they, they group the, the, uh, these structures together by industrial types. So these are all either coal breakers or coal bunkers or uh, uh, kilns. Or, uh, but other than that, they're not necessarily related uh, either with the type of construction materials or the region or the chronology. They just group them together uh, to the extent that they think that the shapes, these sort of forms resonate, right? And again, there's an idea that these buildings have a certain aesthetic because they have not been designed because they are anonymous. And that's how they called their more famous uh, exhibition in 1971. It was called Anonymous Sculptures. So even the early, uh, even the early uh, sort of half timber houses, once they are presented in this format, take on a very different light, right? They, when, we, when we see them in this way, we, the viewer starts to compare them and what was, as a single item was a highly nostalgic uh, uh, sort of piece of preservation becomes here something that is a sort of playful morphological study where our eye keeps bouncing around noticing all the similarities and the differences between the structures in something that is almost uh, like a, uh, not only typological but it's, it's almost like a, uh, visually it's looking like, uh, like almost like an alphabet it's like almost like a font uh, the design of a font so, as I said, by the time the, the Dachers get to this famous exhibition in 1971, they start to be assimilated by the art world as uh, their work is understood as having this very heavy sculptural uh, component to it, basically. And that goes uh, basically to say that when, when the Dachers are putting these two uh, photographs together in a book, that they're, they're Really, they really sort of prompting us to compare them in, in formal terms in a very similar way, I think, as to when someone like Sol Lewitt produces these two sculptures and sort of presents them to us, uh, basically. So we understand there's like an unwritten or, or maybe written but unknown set of rules that produce these things without the intervention of uh, human subjectivity. But then that perhaps doesn't matter so much to the extent that the output is that we get this uh, we get to basically uh, experiment this morphological comparison. So similarly, I think with this, with this series being comparable to these uh, arrays of scraps. So I think the, the fact that they organized both the photography, the photographers and the sculptures and the painters that they all worked uh, with the series and they all worked with the grid is very important because I think it's, it's not only a serial approach. I think it's an, an approach to the series that necessitates all the items of the series being sort of uh, equivalent to one another and where uh, we need to see them simultaneously to understand uh, their formal similarities and differences to the point where the series becomes like a machine for the generation of form. Right? We look at these matrices and we can in our heads continue to imagine other possible instances of these sets of rules and, and constraints. So I think why is that uh, important for architecture? Well, in a nutshell, I think that what this whole process uh, within the art world does is that it renders explicit the, the fascination that architects had already felt for, uh, for the part of the built environment that they don't really, uh, that they don't really produce right? that for, for the anonymous uh, construction, basically. So it, it takes something that had always been 
certain certain longing and certain fascination, and it just puts it in explicit terms. And so I think it, it also makes possible for the architect to, to imagine themselves in the in the in the flesh of these sort of anonymous constructs. So basically what I'm saying is that conceptual and minimal artists propose to inhabit the the role of the architect basically and to use the tools and methodologies of the anonymous builder or anonymous architect but they retain the social contract as artists they use those methods and those sort of almost machines for the production of their artwork but for the art architects seeing the artists do this allows them to imagine that they themselves can take a similar approach basically and that somehow uh, not, not only le legitimates their, uh, their sort of, um, their longing for this uh, part of the built environment, but it also allows them to think of themselves as, as operating with a different degree of agency. So in other words, the art world or conceptual and minimal artists take, they choose photography, documentary photography, and they choose architecture, anonymous architecture, because they are the lowest possible art forms that they that they that they in the sense that they are the least autonomous they are the ones that are more uh, deeply ingrained with the uh, uh, the utilitarian and then uh, and that again is a rebuttal of high modernism and, and the expression of subjectivity but in doing so and in up in appropriating documentary photography and uh, anonymous construction they elevate photography and architecture that had a sort of semi-autonomous status to a different status so for the next generation of architects it's all of a sudden possible to imagine themselves operating with a, uh, at, a at a conceptual level so to speak so and i think that an, an useful comparison i don't know if you can hear my my son david who just made a, a big entrance i'm giving i'm giving a lecture david you need you need to go so actually the so what happens with, with, with uh, or the way I think that that these are compar compar comparable is that they're both they both start with a very sort of nostalgic look backwards into history and end up with a very formal but also very forward uh, sort of approach to morphology. So if we think of the of the arc of the of the career of uh, Aldo Rossi, so in sixty sixty six he's publishing the architecture of the city. That is actually an effort to systematize and a study of the uh, of the existing city of the anonymous both the monuments and the anonymous constructions of the existing city but then immediately after producing this book and, and which was very successful he also realizes that that itself that sort of systematic or more archaeological approach is not enough or doesn't give him tools to work in his own practice and so he comes up with an additional concept which is this idea of analogous architecture by which he uh, basically isolates and simplifies the most salient sort of uh, uh, items or objects of these constructions and turns them into like almost a vocabulary, a vocabulary and a set of rules uh, for their combination. And again, if you're familiar with the work of Rossi, he basically works through this, uh, through the practice of drawing, um, producing these endless configurations of these of these items. So, in a very similar way, he's uh, Starting his career, looking back and trying to systematize and trying to be scientific about uh, about the built reality of the world, and then through the arc of his career, is swinging to an emphasis on morphology and, and autonomy. And something similar could be said of other artists and architects of his of his generation. So, for instance, Ungers. Uh, this is the image. For, this is an image from his entry to the Roosevelt Island competition that bears. A striking resemblance with the grids of the Beggers, but also with the grids of of, um, of Sol Le Witt, where basically I think it can be I think it can be said that in that regard, the generation of uh, Rossi and uh, and Ungers, who in somehow for the first time uh, uh, claim a different status for the architect as an intellectual and as a producer, are basically would not be possible without this previous uh, generation of conceptual and minimal artist or, or in other words that conceptual architecture would not be possible basically without conceptual art and with without conceptual arts borrowings from architecture and um, and construction so maybe i can um, 
maybe I can uh, leave it at that and open it up for uh, questions and conversation. And hopefully we can wrap some of these ideas together. <laughs>